Good evening, folks, and welcome to another Poultry Keepers 360 Live. Jeff and I are here, and we are joined in the studio tonight by Kerry Blackman from beautiful downtown Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, you're not quite in Birmingham, though, are you? I'm a suburb. Suburb? Okay. Yep. Uh, Karen can't be with us tonight. She got <clears throat> wrangled into some uh, tennis tournament, and we certainly hope she does well. But we got a pretty good show for you tonight. Tonight is questions and answers. And coming up in just about five or six seconds, we're going to get to it. Okay. Jeff, I hope you got your thinking hat on. I got my thinking hat on. Uh, you can fill in us when we get fill in for us when we get stumped. How about that? That sounds like a plan. <laughs> Carrie is a member of, of Jeff's Facebook group and uh, Poultry Keeper 360 Facebook group. And um, he actually has his own podcast now. Congratulations for that. It's, what's the name of it, Carrie? Poultry Nerds. Poultry Nerds. Yes, sir. Oh, boy. He, it's a good show. If you've not heard it, you need to to look it up and have a listen to it. It's really good content. Okay, first question for tonight. Every few years, I have a few chicks that end up with bent toes. They're straight when they hatch, and then when they get to be a few weeks old, they really start to bend. And she sent me a picture, and it's a bad bend. If I don't cull the toes, if I don't cull, the toes will eventually face backwards. That's how much toe bend. I can try and find a picture, but I'm not sure if what I'm doing wrong. She found a picture. Um, she said she did do some research. Too much protein would be one reason. Jeff, I haven't heard that. You're our nutritional guru. Have you? Okay. From overfeeding protein inside the bird, no. Only connection I could possibly even fathom is overfeeding protein for too long, too much ammonia in the bedding. If it was wet bedding and it was causing some scar tissue, you know, from standing on wet bedding, that's, that's a far reach. I don't, I don't believe that to be true whatsoever. Um, extra protein really, the only thing that's going to hurt on a bird is the kidneys and your nose from too much ammonia in the brooder. So, yeah, she said she's only getting about two to four chicks out of every 100 she hatches. And this is leading me to think that the issue is genetic rather than a nutritional base or anything else. They're not on wire, are they, Rip? I didn't ask, I didn't think about that. Are they being um, brooded on wire? The pictures I saw were about a six, eight week old chick is fully feathered, but it was out on the ground, but I can, I don't know okay. about the brooding on wire or not. Yeah. I have seen a little bit more, you know, curl deforming of toes. Mm -hmm. If they're raised on wire too long, you know, in the beginning ages while that foot's forming. So I, I didn't even think about that, you know, when you, when you asked, but I, I have seen wire, you know, raising them on wire, um, be a, be an issue. Gotcha. Um, sometimes it's crazy things that can happen, but that's our, our best answer for you tonight. Next question says, I am struggling with how to mix the Portrell Showbird supplement. I was told to fill a five gallon bucket with dry feed and add one cup of oil and one cup of supplement. She feeds a 22% combat meat bird. It seemed like a good combo to mix to me, but now I'm second guessing myself. The package says one teaspoon per 25 chicks per day. Does this mix, does this mix technique sound correct for chicks? Jeff? Well, okay. So it's one cup for a, for one half of a five gallon bucket. So you fill a five gallon bucket half full should be of a good feed. That'll be 12 and a half or 13 pounds. Then you put one cup of oil and you put one cup of breeder supplement. And yes, that is the correct mix. So, um, and it'll work fine. You know, it doesn't, I think people get a little too uptight or too perfectionist um, when they think about this breeding process or this mixing process, mm -hmm. right? I agree. Pour, on, pour on your oil, 
you know, scatter in your, your breeder supplement, you know, mix it up with your hand for about two, three minutes. It's good enough. Okay. It, you know, don't, you're not going to make it perfect and it doesn't need to be perfect. You know, if it gets some breeder supplement today and none tomorrow and some the day after, it's still going to work. It'll work just fine. Right. So I think some people just get a little, you know, like, like I said, a little stressed that it has to be this perfect homogenous blend. Yes. And it really doesn't have to be. I was kind of that way at first. I'll confess, you know, <laughs> it may be hard to believe. Uh, no, it, that's, but it's a, it's, it's a half a five gallon bucket. It's two and a half gallons of feed. Let's say it that way. Two and a half gallons of feed, uh, a cup of breeder supplement, a cup of oil, and that's the mix. And that is correct. And that will do chicks, yep. starter, it's, growers, it's, everything. You know, their feed intake is proportionate to their age and their body weight. Right. So as they get older, they get more. And that's that's the way it works. It's very good. Let's see. We got a question from uh, uh, one of our group members said, I have a question about feeding incubated eggs back to my flock. This question was asking another group and there were various opinions. I don't feed incubated eggs, but I was wondering what others do. Um, if it's a clear egg, I can't allow my eggs at seven days. And then again, just before I uh, put them into the hatcher. But if it's a clear egg at day seven, I have fed those eggs. I boiled them and chopped them up and fed them back to my birds. Uh, if it had a dead embryo in it, I did not. Now, whether that's good, bad, right, or wrong, that's just what I've been doing for a lot of years. Uh, Rip, you know, to go with what you just said, the key factor is there you hard boiled them. So you cooked them and you killed any potential bacteria that yeah. might have started growing in that first seven to 10 days. Um, I wouldn't feed an embryo back, no. but like you, if it was a clear egg and you cooked it, but I saw that, I saw that question on one of the other, uh, groups and I'm like, I'm not feeding an embryo back to, and, and nobody said anything about cooking. I took it as they were feeding it, you know, raw. Yeah. I wouldn't back. do that. There's just too much that can, to me, there's too many, too many potential, you know, issues with that, right. particularly with bacteria growth. I agree. Uh, and along that line, we got a Rob Garen chipped in here and says, I feed clear incubated eggs raw back to my flock. They used to sell one week old incubated eggs to the baking industry. Hadn't heard that, but. Hmm. Yeah. I hadn't either. Uh, hey, we're here to learn too. So that's right. That, that's good. Thanks for your input, Rob. We really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Our next question here is, do, 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 do. I need some advice on hatching time incubators. Every couple of weeks, my incubator drops temperature like it's going to be the active cooling stage. I have turned that off and it gets stuck at 93 degrees. No matter what I do, it's stuck. After six or eight hours of wiggling, uh, blowing on the sensor and removing any dust, unplugging and plugging back in, it resumes temperature and runs another 14 to 16 days uh, before the problem recurs. Uh, that's a, a new one on me. I, that's not a problem I have encountered with the hatching time machines. I've got one myself. Uh, Kerry, have you heard anything along that line? It just seems such an odd. So I do know that they have a setting in them where they – they will simulate a hen getting off of eggs. Um, they do that periodically. Right. But if you're having the problem like was described, that would be different. And I will say that Hatch and Time has really good support. They do. So I would email them and be prepared to send them some videos and some pictures of what's going on. I had a problem with my incubator one time and a couple of emails and videos back and forth. And they wound up sending me everything I needed to fix the problem. There, I have really been impressed with their customer service. 
they they do a top notch job. They really, really do. Okay, experts. I guess that's us, huh? <laughs> Would you please share your favorite hygrometer for incubating? I'm figuring my egg's weight loss at day 18, and I'm getting a lot of 9 to 10 percent instead of 12 to 16 percent. So I guess my humidity was too high. The average humidity through incubation was about 45 percent. I recorded readings daily, both in the morning and the evening. She lives in northeastern Vermont, so not a super dry climate. Um, I've had really good luck with uh, the Govi uh, data recorders, and they'll, they'll record both the uh, temperature and the humidity. Gary, what's your favorite hygrometer? Where do you I have I was going to say, I use the Govi. I've got the Wi-Fi model that, you know, it's not the base model that a lot of people talk about. It's... Mm -hmm. The one I want to say, I, they're like 35, 40 bucks for one of them, but they have very accurate data. And I've had really good luck with mine. I have compared them to the Therm Pros and them be set on the same, the same temperature. I just like the Go V one because it connects to my Wi Fi network and I use a couple of them to monitor my different incubators. I have not tried the Therm Pro, but I've, I've heard some folks that use it and like it. But uh, my per personal preference over the years has been the Gobi. See, I think we got some comment here. Unless I missed it. Ah, here we go. We were talking earlier about mixing feed and Rob Guerin says people worry about their birds getting a perfect diet every meal and feed their kids meals that fluctuate in nutrition. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with that, Rob. Yep. There's no way you're going to get a perfect diet, right? And no. so the inside joke amongst us nutritionists, regardless of species, is there's four different rations, right? So there's the one that we make with the computer and, you know, the calculator and, and the work that we put into it. Then there's the one that the feed mill actually manufactures. Then there's the one that the farmer actually provides to the animal. And then the one the animal actually eats, right? So there's no way, I mean, we all just try and get it as close as we can to perfect, but there's, there's too many variables in actually getting that perfect diet to the bird. So. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, it it's boggles my mind sometimes. <laughs> okay. Another question here. For those of you who hatch your own birds, I have a couple of questions. I'm looking for experience only. I've read so many articles and threads on this. My head is spinning. Um, that can really happen when you're looking around on the internet, trying to find the information you need and you want. And uh, it does get more than a little bit confusing. In your experience, how does it, I'm not sure she, I'm trying to sort this out. In your experience, does how the eggs are turned have a more pronounced effect on hatching rate than humidity or temperature fluctuation. And I don't know if she's talking about if the eggs are turned set upright and turned back and forth or laid down on their side and rotated back. I'm, that's, that's where I'm getting a little lost in the weeds here. But, uh, well, I can say this, Rip. I, I have had a GQF 1502. Mm -hmm. that in that it holds the, the tray, it holds the eggs um, vertically and it tilts from side to side. And in my hatching time with the, the way their trays are made, I will lay the eggs horizontally and it will rotate forward and backwards. So between the two, 
if it the way that you read the question, if I understood it correctly, she's asking which one of those methods is better. And I've had really great hatch rates with both, but that is maintaining a, a consistent level of humidity as well. Right. I I think they all play a, a major role in how how well our eggs hatch. Um, and early on, I can remember. I don't know if somebody told me, I read it somewhere, but the important thing about turning eggs that you do it an odd number of times per day. So the embryo doesn't lay on the same side of the egg overnight for multiple days. Um, but as far as, you know, I've had GQFs, I've had Dickies, I've had Brincies, uh, and they all use a slightly different turning situation. Um, but the hatching time, uh, the eggs are incub uh, incubated in an upright position and then rocked back and forth that way. And I've, gosh, I've had several hundred percent hatches out of that. So I can't complain about that. Uh, she also wants to know, do you use standard humidity settings or weigh your eggs? A lot of the humidity settings are going to be governed really by where you live geographically. Here in, in the hot, humid jungles of central Florida, <laughs> our natural humidity is, is pretty high. But you get up there in Jeff's area in, in Pennsylvania and and up into that area, they don't have the, the humidities that we do. So it's really a bit of a learning curve about learning what humidity works best for you. Um, I, I will say my first hatch in my hatching time, I, I went with their settings and had a, about a 95% hatch. So that was, that was pretty good. Um, I, Probably would if I was going to go by a particular method, I wouldn't use the weight of the eggs uh, as much as I would depend on the size of the air cell of the egg as it develops. And there's a lot of charts out there that'll show you what that egg, uh, excuse me, air air cell should look like as the chicks are developing, and you want it growing over time. If you start to see it a lot of air cell developing real quickly, you probably, your humidity is a little bit too low. And if it's not developing enough, you probably got too much humidity in your incubator. I find just monitoring that air cell uh, gives me the best results overall. Jeff, here's a good one for you. My daughter will be showing our partridge wind up banner for the first time. I'm curious as to what everyone feeds their showbirds. <laughs> I hear this so many times. What do you feed your showbirds? What do you feed your showbirds? Yeah, it's it's like somebody's baiting me to say, oh, feed a 24% game bird, right? <laughs> and no, it's not, okay? It's, you know, actually uh, a good 16, 17, or 18% but not focusing on the protein, right? And, you know, something like a dot, I'd actually, and, and you're never going to find out this information, but I'd be more worried about, okay, so everybody's heard me say it a hundred times, you know, the amino acids are what's going to make your feather quality, right? Your, your feather structure, but your feather coloring actually is going to come out of appropriate trace minerals and the mineral, you know, the small mineral content in the feed, you know, because if you want that really darker black, right, if you're looking for that really coal black, you know, you've got to have the right amount of manganese. And, you know, if you're looking for some form orange color, you're going to be looking for, you know, the right amount of iron content. It just depends on what you know, so making sure actually all those trace minerals are important and trace minerals are expensive. So most commercial feeds are going to run them at that minimum levels. 
um, you know, because they just run the cost up. And so to, to me, the color is about the trace minerals and the quality or the structure of the feather is about the, the amino acids combined with the right level of protein. So I would say 18%. You know, that 1.1, 1.2 lysine, uh, 0.48 to 0.52 methionine. Um, actually, I'm looking for some guinea pigs because I've had some really good information given to me about the use of cysteine. And I want to, I want somebody who can check that for me, right? So I want to make up an experiment batch and run it and, you know, side by side, a group with and a group without. And let's see if we can notice significant feather improvement. Jeff, I'm going to ask this question only because I raise reds and, and I always get peaked by uh, interested in this, but you said manganese for black and mm -hmm. iron for the reddish tones. What's a good level to look for? Usually we don't have a problem getting the right amount of iron, depending on where you live, right? The grains normally will bring in, you know, enough iron, but we're looking for those iron levels to be about 150 parts per million, maybe 200 parts per million. Um, you know, so, <clears throat> but like with your reds, the reds that I saw at Ohio, your reds and other, you know, true reds, they're so dark, right? it goes way beyond the iron. So here, believe it or not, your manganese is making your red even darker. Iron by itself Makes is going to get, you know, iron by itself would give you that color, you know, uh, the Rhode Island red that you'd get at Tractor Supply, for instance, right? Is it doesn't really have that depth of red to the feather color, like, like a, a true show bird or a mm -hmm. real, you know, breed should. Um, and that's where that combination of your iron and your manganese is going to get you that depth of color, you know, because those Rhode Island reds, yeah, they're red, but they're not far from being black. I mean, they're that rich in color that I saw. Um, I think they are dark. A, yeah, it's going to be a combination of those two trace minerals. Now, look, I don't want anybody listening to go out and start buying manganese and iron <laughs> supplement and start sprinkling it on their chicken feed that that's a train wreck waiting to happen that's yes. not the way to do this but understand that those trace minerals are going to be key you know to getting the proper coloration out of your bird because if you had too much iron um and you had a white bird it's just like having too much corn you know you can get that yellow tinge mm -hmm. to a white bird Right. And if you're not careful, too much iron is going to show up and change that color of that feather as well. So getting those trace minerals balanced correctly is really, really important. Was asking, are the lysine and methionine balances the same for ducks and turkeys? They are for turkeys. Actually, turkeys have a little bit higher requirement than chickens. Uh, Barbara, I'm going to be honest with you. I have not seen anybody on on show ducks that has a really good answer. Okay, so I'm only going based on what I've learned, and there's no hard data. Um, I'm going to say yes. The methionine can be just a little bit lower for ducks because I believe that they can process it better than a chicken, and uh, but. Yeah, I, they're going to be very close. I, I would stay with the same lysine methionine levels if I had ducks, but there's no reported data for any type of heritage or show duck that I can show you to prove it. And I, as you were talking, I was sitting here thinking, I don't think I've ever seen it mentioned, to be honest with you, for waterfowl. Uh, I have not. I, really, there's nothing for the show birds, right? But I can extrapolate from other um, from other sources right. to get me really close, right? Um, that with you know some experience gives me a good feeling that these are the levels I need to be, right? And we're seeing that with the chicken side uh, and with the turkey side. 
but you know, uh, I I can't find any good old data on ducks to to guide me. I really can't. So uh, I'm going with the assumption that yes, they're very close to the same as a chicken for amino acids. Very good. Um, I just scrolled past one comment here. I wanted to to pick up while we were uh, talking about that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Well, we missed the one from Victor. So whenever you're ready for that one, that's actually the one I was going for. Oh no, no, he had one oh. earlier too. So oh, but the answer is yes. Um, if you go too high on amino acids, you can actually wreck a feather, right? So you can go too high. You can suppress appetite. And you can actually overstimulate with amino acids, the feather part, um, you know, and you can end up with, you know, brittle, just f fragile, like you can't overdo the amino acids. So the right amount's right. Too little is bad. Too much is bad. But yeah, back, back at the beginning of the show, he had the one about what the perfect brooder box size for yes. uh, chicks is. Um, Victor, I like to have birds to have one square foot by the time each, by the time they're four weeks old. So my rule of thumb is a quarter of a square foot, one quarter square foot per bird, per chick per week. So you start out with a quarter of a square foot, then you go to a half Then week two, you go to three quarters on week three and one square foot per bird on week four. Um. I've seen the best results with that. Easy to remember that one. I, yeah, it's worked very well for me. Um, and I've been given that recommendation for, I don't know, 15 or more years by now. So, um, cause if you give them too much space when they're real young, they run all over the place, right? Cause they're curious and they want to see everything, but they don't spend enough time eating. So you want to crowd them that first week to make sure that you're getting food and water into them then you can gradually give them more space to, you know, uh, for their curiosity purposes. Very good. Uh, let's see. We had another one here that I wanted to pull up before we got back to some of the ones I had written down. Oh, here's one from Laura. We had our first ever stargazer chick. What do you recommend in that case? You know, when you only have one, and I don't know what the, uh, uh, Laura, I don't know what your hatch size was, but when I only see like one out of a hundred, I, I really think that it's, there's a, I think it's a pinch in the vertebrae in the neck. I, I, I hate to say it's a thiamine deficiency. Everybody wants to go straight to thiamine deficiency and it could be, but you know, one in a hundred is not a thiamine deficiency. If you had 10 in a hundred, then we have a problem. Then we do, right. you know, then we have a nutritional problem. You know, one, I think we just, you know, something went wrong at hatch, something, you know, maybe something was wrong with its mother. Something didn't form right as the embryo. Um, I, I think he probably had a pinched nerve in his neck. So yep. she added later said it did not make it. Okay. Yep. I, I have to go with either a formation problem in the, in the, in the hatcher or in the incubator, or I have to go with, uh, you know, something more genetic, but I would bet it's probably something, you know, through incubation and, and skeletal formation. And she said she kind of chalked it up as a fluke. Uh, I would too. Yeah. Okay. Let me get back to the list here. I'm in Massachusetts. I would like to try making my own feed using Jeff's breeder layer recipe. Do I need to grind the grains? And if so, is there an inexpensive way to do this? I don't want to invest in an expensive grain mill until I decide if this is something I'm committing to long term. You need to at least crack them, in my opinion. I, I don't like whole grains. And as Carrie found out the hard way, you, you got to do more than just crack a soybean. So 
You know, you got to have some way to process them now. And I've seen people actually use the blade type uh, coffee grinder that you mm-hmm. can get for, you know, 10 bucks at any, any store. Um, and if you learn how long to pulse it, uh, you can also use a food processor. You know, most kitchens have a food processor, you know, with the blades in there. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, you're using the pulse function. You're not just turning it on until you get the desired particle size. So there are ways to do it. It's a lot of work. But, um, look, I had a lady, uh, she was in Northern Minnesota and she ordered every grain as human food grade. So she got wheat and split peas and all of her ingredients. And she made every bit of the chick feed or the chicken feed from start to finish for 50 broilers in her backyard with a Vitamix mixer. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if you're dedicated enough, because that was the food for her and her daughter's family, right? So she ordered all the food in five gallon buckets, food grade, feed, you know, human food grade. And I made the recipe for her and she'd blend it up every week. You know, every other day she'd get her Vitamix out and she'd make chicken feed. So look, if you're dedicated enough to it, Anybody can make their own chicken feed. <clears throat> We've even done a show on that, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob suggests you uh, buy a used grain mill, and if you decide not to keep it, keep at it, you can sell it for what you paid for it. Yep. I agree. I see, I see folks looking for those things on a regular basis. You know, I bought one off of eBay. I think I spent maybe $200 mm-hmm. for it. And I use it a lot. And what I do is I I found a good consistency where I run my corn through and I crack it up pretty good. I run the soybean through and I crack it up pretty good. I mix everything together and then I run all of it through there. And it really gives it a good blend and it works out really well. And when that $200 unit dies, I'll either buy another one or buy... A lot bigger one. Well, you're also getting to the point to where you're dealing. You've really had to scale up your operation too. Yeah, I'm. I'm making 150, 300 pounds of feed at a time. I I feed. If you're with just my breeding stock, I'm feeding 27, 28 pounds of feed a day. So, yeah, the if you're going to use a a, a pulser from home. If you, if you, like Jeff said, if you got the patience, it can be done. Mm-hmm. But for me, I thought $200 was nothing to see if it was something that I could do. And it does take time. But now that I know the nutrition that my birds have and I put a little bit of time into it. And instead of eating four ounces or so a day, they're eating two and a half ounces a day. So it saves in the long run. You know, Carrie, you don't realize it, but you just gave us a really good segue to something I I know nobody's going to ask and something that Jeff did today. But, Jeff, you actually created a, um Excel spreadsheet on comparing your cost to feed and the feed ingredients and all that. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think <laughs> I found it extremely useful. Right. So, you know, uh, watching the poultry keepers 360 group and my poultry breeder nutrition group and other groups out there, you know, I'm always seeing people talking about adding red cell or poultry cell or, you know, something, right. They they always want to add something. And, you know, so I was like, you know, what is it, what is this actually costing to feed a chicken by adding all these extra supplements? Right. And, So that's, you know, out of my own curiosity. So I I didn't do this, you know, just to pick on anybody. But uh, out of my own curiosity, I really wanted to know. So if somebody's buying like a local, you know, 16% layer feed from Tractor Supply or wherever down the road, you know, the birds are going to eat about four ounces for the average hen. Um, You can put in your own prices, right? 
So you can do your own cost comparison. There's pretty good instructions to go with it. But it was interesting because four ounces of like a standard commercial layer feed. But then if you added, you know, like breeder supplement to it or you added something, any, you know, anything else to enhance it, to make it better. You were up above 15 cents per bird per day on cost. So then if, you know, I factored in, okay, so let's say you went with, um, like Rip, you have a triple M feed, mm-hmm. Carrie, you're working with the Kraut Creek feed, um, soon to have your own private label. But when you're working with a feed that has all those components already added to it, basically has the breeder supplement, the nutrition levels are right for the types of birds that you're raising. Um, you could take out the breeder supplement and like Carrie said, instead of feeding four ounces, you can feed three ounces. The birds are still satisfied and performing because of the quality of the feed. And it actually costs 13 cents. So you're saving, I think I figured it out, Rip, when you and I were talking about it. It was 2.2 cents per bird per day. And that's with a $10 a bag difference in feed price. So the local 16%, let's, I, I figured around $25. And shipping in a, a feed, you know, well, you know, Rip's kind of lucky because he's his is getting dropped off by truck and he's got friends in low places and he can get it, you know, pretty good. But <laughs> most, people, all heart. most people to get that feed of that quality or what Carrie's getting, you know, you're going to be in that $35, $36 range. So for $10 or $11 more, but it actually costs you less because you don't have all those other supplements going into it. Right. And it was mind boggling to me. I I wanted to know, I wanted to know for myself, you know, what is, what is the true cost difference between, you know, paying for that premium feed, right. Versus, you know, trying to make local feed adequate. And it, it just blew my mind. So. And you know, that doesn't even factor in time. No, that was that doesn't factor in any time whatsoever. Uh, and Jeff, where can they get a copy of this spreadsheet? Well, it's on Poultry Keepers 360 in the file section. It's also on Poultry Breeder Nutrition on the file section. And somebody told me that somebody put it on the breast group yes. site. Fran- uh, Francie put that. Yeah, Francie put it out there. Rip, I have no idea where else you put it. You like to put things all over the place, so... <laughs> I, I only, I, I didn't do that. I'm not responsible for once. That may change tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> so far it's in three places. And, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and, and I thought I gave pretty good instructions on how to use it. Right. Uh, very simple, very straightforward. I, I Even so. I can understand them. So. But. Uh, folks, I would encourage you to, to download that spreadsheet, plug in all your data, and I think you're going to be surprised and shocked at what you see. I really do. Uh, Let's go with this one here. Thomas Jeffries, do you have any specific recommendations for a meat bird scalder that you have had experience with? Thomas, I've never used one. <clears throat> there's only one scalder there's only one company making a scalder i can recommend and that's the poultry man um made by uh older mennonite up here eli rife but mm-hmm. you look up poultry man um p- poultry man processing equipment it's not hard to find it's all stainless steel comes in three or four different sizes depending on how many birds he wants to do um but you know they're they're in operation they work well good customer support you know and in my opinion that's that is the scalder to have right so well like i said i've never used one so i'm going to back your opinion 100 percent there buddy okay i mean featherman makes one and it's okay um and then you start jumping into the really expensive stuff you know, um, like Ashley, which is a commercial grade, but, uh, still a lot of people that had Ashley's are gone to, gone to the poultry man just because they've got better features. They've got better customer service parts are available. 
right? You can talk to the man who makes them, right? So if you're having an issue, they can talk you through it. So if I was going to be scalding and processing broilers, I would be calling the folks at Poultry Man Processing. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Barbara's got another good one here. I was cautioned about pelleted feed being a potential problem. Is it true feeding pelleted feed could cause a gizzard to atrophy or shut down? And I, this is something we talked about before, but uh, without, I'll, I'll try to contain myself. So I'll just let Jeff answer this. <laughs> That's all right, Rip. You can answer it. So look, I mean, uh, the pelleted feed, people need to understand this okay to make a pelleted feed first they grind the snot out of it right they turn it into talcum powder then they make it a pellet and when it hits the gizzard by then it's softened and moistened enough through the crop before it ever even really gets to the gizzard it's already starting to disintegrate and fall apart so there's no particles there to 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 stimulate the gizzard to want to contract and you know there, there's no gizzard stimulation now, I, I wouldn't call it atrophy or shutdown but <clears throat> the gizzard definitely is not working the same as lazy it does. gizzard yeah yeah as as it does you know a bird that's eating cracked grains um or more of a mash or a coarse textured feed uh i you know the same man that that designed that sculptor I was talking about, Eli Reif. Mm -hmm. He's done he's done field days over the years, uh, up there processing field days of corn, you know, Cornish crossbirds. <clears throat> and I'm usually at them, right? So inevitably, you know, we're doing pasture raised birds the day of the field day. And uh, but occasionally like somebody will bring when they clean out a commercial chicken house, they'll bring in they don't take all the birds. So if a bird can't walk or if a bird doesn't look good, they leave it behind. People will bring them in. So we've been fortunate enough to have some commercial birds to process and you can lay the gizzards, right? So a commercial bird gizzard, barely bigger than a 50 cent piece, um, say golf ball size, right? And then you get the gizzard out of an equal size bird that's been raised on pasture and grain and the gizzard has twice the mass. Like if you put them on a scale, the gizzard of that bird that basically free ranging is the term this group would use, but that, that gizzard is twice the weight, right? It, it's mind boggling the difference. So they just don't have to work, right? There's yep. no effort in eating a pellet. And, you know, well, I'll, Sue's got an admonishment here. And don't forget the grit. <laughs> That's 100%, right. Sue. Yep. Thanks, Sue. Don't forget the grit. <clears throat> and it's not like grit's a horribly expensive thing to feed your chickens. Oh, it's relatively cheap. It's like gold, Rip. Don't you know that? You can't afford grit. <laughs> Why would you pay for rocks? You got plenty out there already. I got a more. I Shoot, I got more in my head than I have laying around here in the yard. Yep. I will say, since I started making my own feed, I've discovered that grit, buy, go ahead and buy a 50-pound bag. Your birds are going to use it anyway. Yeah. And you would be surprised at how much cheaper it is to buy a 50-pound bag than it is to buy the little five-pound bags that you see in the stores. Oh, I know. And it's not like it's going to go bad or anything. You know, heat and humidity is not going to affect rocks. So you can only get you. one size. And, you know, all I've ever seen by the Mana Pro or whoever, the little bag at, at the store, Yeah, yeah. it's always been small, you know, chick size grit, right? You never see grower, layer. Uh, mm -mm. For sure, you're never going to see turkey grit. So <clears throat> I've never seen any down here, that's for sure. No, no, it's... Yeah, and like I said, it it does it never goes bad, right? And if you decide you're going to quit chickens and you got leftover grit, it works really good as landscaping stone. So I can tell you, I can show you some in my yard. So <laughs> I tell you what, we used to do with it at the museum. We had a oh gosh, 
I don't know, 1500 square foot model train layout. And we use grit to do all the road beds throughout that whole thing. I bet it looked great. good. Yeah. I did. It looked sharp. Yeah. Okay. Here's one from Rob. Nope. I got yep, Victor. Victor. They keep hopping around on me. I didn't not, do it. You did. I know you didn't, but it's all Karen's fault. She's not okay. here to keep me straight. Can you feed a pellet and just occasionally give scratch to keep the gizzard working? I'm not a believer in that plan, but that's just my opinion. Not, not to upset anybody, but I think, you know, grain should be some type of coarse grain should be a daily part of the diet. Even if it's a small amount, right? So um, I put formulas together that are half pellet, half grain. Uh, and I think those work okay. There's a few mixes out there that I've put together that are three quarter pellet and a quarter grain, and I wouldn't go any less than 25%. That's just my opinion. So I've seen some of those that you were talking about first, the, the one with a little bit higher grain ratio in it. Yeah. And, and that feed just looks so appealing to me. I just, if I was chicken, I'd eat the heck out of that stuff. But uh, it just makes a good-looking feed, and uh, I, I wish I could get some down here. I really do. Now let's get to Victor's, Victor's question here. Okay. He says he goes to his local mill, and he gets the right size grit. Yep. He's in a place where he can his feed mill will will put the right size grit and make it available. So, Victor, you're a very lucky person. He is. He doesn't know how lucky he is. That's for sure. Okay. How are we doing on time here? Oh, we got time. Yeah. Um, here's one. I'm shopping for chick starter and noticed a lot of the Kalmbach labels read no animal byproducts. Is vegetarianism just the new norm in poultry feed? Should I be concerned with optimum, excuse me, optimal absorption from all the plant matter? I'd like to hear some nutrition-based thoughts on this topic. No, I'm, I've never met a vegetarian chicken in my life. No. Uh, it ain't going to happen. So if you don't feed them meat, they're going to eat each other. They're going to satisfy that need by eating feathers or the back end out of their neighbor or whatever. So, um, But that's what society thinks they want. So the manufacturers are answering the call of the consumer. Right? But if they look a little harder, there's three or four blends that Kambach actually puts out. One has pork, meat and bone meal in it. Uh, they have one with fish meal in it. So they are using, you know, they are, they do have formulas that have meat protein in them. But <clears throat> the standard that they're going to push first are going to be vegetarian fed because the consumer doesn't understand that a chicken, you know, used to be a dinosaur that ate meat. So, uh, but yeah. So again, it, it, it's commercial agriculture, commercial supplier, just giving the consumer what they think they want. Right. It's easier to sell that than it is to sell education. Boy, don't we know that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, here's another one for you, Jeff, because I'm kind of clueless on this one. Is there any evidence that non-GMO feed is in and of itself higher nutritional quality in any confirmed way? I'm not concerned about genetic modifications or the pesticides, herbicides in conventional crops, but if non-GMO crops or otherwise nutritionally superior for some reason, I'll give them another look. Look, it doesn't matter whether it's conventional, non-GMO, or organic, okay? The nutritional levels of the grain are going to be based on the overall fertility and quality of the soil. So <clears throat> those titles have nothing to do with nutritional quality. Those titles are letting you know how the grain was grown, right? So was the seed stock from 
not genetically modified. And if you go the next layer to organic, that means it was grown without herbicides, pesticides, any synthetic fertilizers, um, and the seed stock was not genetically modified, right? So, look, I can take you to a conventional farmer who, f who grows genetically modified grains, but he's got a really good soil fertility plan, and the nutritional component of his grain is going to be higher than someone who may be organic who only farms with chicken manure okay so you're measuring the soil quality and the fertility and the farming practices when you look at nutritional value you're not looking at the actual title conventional non-gmo and or organic does that make sense to you guys yep makes okay. sense to me it's all about the soil at that point it has nothing to do with the name um uh... Coincidentally, I came across a thing today, and I, I shared it with Kerry, uh, a little online quiz to test your knowledge about soils. Uh, I didn't see a reason to put it up on our uh, our groups today, but now after you said that, I think I've got a reason. And, and uh, it's a very enlightening study. I think you'll enjoy it. So I'll try to get that up tomorrow. Okay, I've got a, one more question here. My hens are starting to lay less and less eggs per day. And the actual egg size is getting smaller. What can cause this? I'm using Jeff's recipe for layers. Maybe I'm off of the recipe a little. I forget calcium sometimes. Can this cause it? And another question. Can any respiratory diseases in poultry cause poor egg production? She lives in North Carolina. And she has uh, mixed breeds and some pure breasts also. Yeah, that egg size getting smaller. So uh, when the weather gets hotter, the bird eats less, right? Because it mm -hmm. wants less calories, it wants less body temperature, it has less of an appetite. And so when it eats less, you can see egg size diminish if you don't adjust your protein up based on you know the, the average daily feed consumption right so when it gets hot you need to raise your proteins you should be probably you know summers i hate to say this but summer's not far away how's that and <clears throat> you know so down there in florida or warmer climates we go to a 19 or 20 percent layer feed for the for the summer just because instead of eating four ounces of feed, the birds drop down to two and a half or three. So we have to have that 30% increase in protein to keep our egg size where it's supposed to be. Um, and we even do it up here, right? Um, so in the winter we can feed, in Pennsylvania, we can feed 15, 16. Uh, when the summer hits, we'll be up to an 18. Some people even go to a 19, depending on the breed, you know, location uh housing conditions but so summer's around the corner get ready to make that adjustment you know so keep an eye on those egg weights it'll be here before we know it uh, yeah it, it'll be it, faster for you guys down there oh it's trust me we've already hit 87 88 degrees down here uh, yeah, it's here it's here um and the last part of her question was can respiratory diseases in poultry cause poor egg production all the respiratory diseases every in one poultry of them. will typically you'll see a 20 to 30 percent drop in egg production um, if you get a really severe newcastle's uh disease you, you know you can see a 50 percent drop over about two week time yeah um i mean an acute newcastle outbreak you can go down to 20 percent production uh, and that you're still doing good there, but you've also had a 20% mortality. So yeah, every one of the, every one of the respiratory diseases will cause a reduction in egg production, eggs produced. It, shoot, any kind of stress really can throw them off sometimes. It doesn't. Can. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like stress. Nope. But they stress less if you feed them better. That's true. So. I think both of you guys have noticed that feeding your birds better 
instead of running away from you, now all of a sudden they're anxious to see you. So anxious to see me, they're darn tripping fall hazards. Yeah. Yeah. They come right up running. They're, they're happy to see you when you show up now. Yep. <laughs> yeah. If your birds aren't happy to see you, you're doing something wrong. Very good. I think that's about all. I think we got to all the questions we had, uh, both uh, online and uh, the ones I pulled from uh, our groups. But I do want, before I go, I do want to say one thing. And I, uh, some of you know, I, I work with uh, Mandolin Royal and John Gunnerman to do the Poultry Keepers podcast, who it's, it's a lot of fun working with those two. Uh, we, and we can, uh, I won't say get carried away, but we have been known to uh, chase a rabbit every now and then. Yeah, doing that. You, get, you get carried away. I've been going through those podcasts. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, the educational value, the educational and the entertainment value are about <laughs> equal in those podcasts. So <clears throat> uh, I'm not a podcaster, right? I am not a podcast listener, but I'm having a blast going through those. But uh, just as you said that, Victor, pumped in this uh, last oh, okay. comment. Yeah. You know, and he was told to feed a lower maintenance feed, like 14% during the summer. And he goes, is this the correct thing to do during the summertime? And absolutely not. Victor. No. Absolutely not. If you want to get eggs and you want your birds to be happy, you want to be 18, 19% protein through the summer. Um, you know, cut back on how much you're feeding them. Give them a little extra water. Try and get it to them cold. And, but you do not want to do a 14% maintenance feed through the summer mm -mm. that, that those birds are going to be horribly unhappy. You will not be their best friend, Victor. No. Um, I just want to mention a couple other things about the podcast before we go. Um, I was looking at some statistics today and uh, we're almost at 15,000 downloads in a 10 month period. Uh, <laughs> is that good? That is, that is awesome. That's is good. that good? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know the stats. I'd like for it to be better, but I know when we started out, the first months we were in business, we averaged about sixteen and a half downloads a day, and so far this month we've been averaging a hundred and thirteen, almost one hundred and fourteen downloads per day. But we often get asked, why do you do the podcast? And I've got a clip that, and I've already posted it online, but uh, I think it sums up why we do the podcast. I think it sums up why we do Poultry Keepers 360 live streams. Uh, but let's, let's have a listen to it. We want to be a place for reliable information that you can reach out to and it's there it, and it's not hidden behind a paywall. And how can we get you to build a really high quality birds and flock consistency? Well, to be I, supportive and to help people get to success too, because when I first started with poultry, we didn't have these online communities of support and education. It was library books and the advice of whoever you happen to meet. The internet mm -hmm. was not around. So right. adapting to the changes and the entire wealth of information that's now pretty readily available so long as you have that internet connection but that's why we do the podcast I, and um, i feel like that's why we do poultry keeper 360 live um, uh, we don't have all the answers rip but you no. know what we'll go dig and look for them yep you know, uh, do that on I, a daily basis yeah, it was like I, I reached out to you. I'm trying and on the on the group. I'm trying to find out how you use that Denigard to mm -hmm. dip eggs that might have MG, you know, to break that vertical cycle of transmitting through the egg. Um, I know I've seen it before, but I can't find the I can't find the, the information. I can't find good, hard, reliable data is what I'm trying to say. It, there's some anecdotal stuff out there. But I can't find anything to hang I, I my can't hat on. So. I, I even looked. You would think that it would be on the Denigard website, but no, 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 no. Just they only give you the recommendations on how to treat birds with it. But yeah, I know. But yeah, but yeah, um, don't know. But I just would like to thank Carrie for joining us tonight. I know you were 
you're probably tired after your extended drive from uh, Alabama to Pennsylvania. Uh, it, it's been good having you on. We've certainly enjoyed having you with us. Jeff, thank you very much, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Always a good time. It is. It enjoyed is it. Indeed. I get in trouble every time I hang out with you, Rip. So. Oh, geez. Well, I don't have a <laughs> wife to complain about it, but I still get in trouble one way or the other. <laughs> You're a bad influence on us young fellows. Uh, well, here we go with the age again. <laughs> 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 Folks, thank you so much for watching. And we will see you in two weeks. So long. Thanks, Rip. See you.